Let me introduce the four speakers one by one, and after they've taken their seats, I'll cover the format, and we'll go right to it. First, Dr. Sean Carroll, theoretical physicist here at Caltech, working on theoretical aspects in cosmology, field theory, and gravitation, and particularly works on inflation and the arrow of time, dark matter, dark energy, <clears throat> modified gravity, and the rest. Author of the best-selling book, From Eternity to Here, The Question the quest for the ultimate theory of time, which he'll be signing along with the other authors in the break at 4 p.m. And of course, the graduate textbook, Space, Time, and Geometry, the lectures on cosmology for the teaching company. Please welcome Dr. Sean Carroll. <laughs> Sean, welcome. Dr. Ian Hutchinson, Professor of Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT. Primary research interest, plasma physics, especially the magnetic confinement of plasmas, which enable fusion reactions to be used for practical energy production, and I'm talking 50 million degrees Celsius. So he's a hot speaker. Uh, <laughs> 160 journal articles on plasma phenomena, He's known for uh, the important monograph, Principles of Plasma Diagnostics. He has served on most of the major review panels, fellow of the American Physical Society, the Institute for Physics. Also, an important speaker speaking on the relationship between science and Christian faith. His most recent book, 2011, Monopolizing Knowledge. Please welcome Dr. Ian Hutchinson. <laughs> Ian, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Uh, the next debater, probably less well-known, founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, <laughs> editor of Skeptic.com, director of the Skeptic Society, monthly columnist for Scientific American, and adjunct professor at Claremont Graduate University and Chapman University, please welcome our very own Michael Shermer. <laughs> Michael. Hmm. And finally, Denise D'Souza is an author and public speaker, a former research fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, currently president of King's College in New York City. He's a noted Christian apologist and conservative writer and speaker, born and raised Catholic, now evangelical Christian, the author of a number of New York Times best-selling books, including What's So Great About Christianity, Life After Death, The Evidence, The End of Racism, and his latest book, which he also will be signing later, God Forsaken, Bad Things Happen, Is There a God Who Cares? Yes, Here's Proof. Please welcome <laughs> Denise D'Souza. Welcome, Denise. <clears throat> Since the affirmative science has refuted religion comes first in classical debate. We will proceed in the following order. Opening statements uh, in the order Sean, Ian, Michael, and Denise. Then rebuttals, five minutes each, same order. We have a time, Teutonic timekeeper here in the front row who will guarantee not one second will elapse <laughs> beyond the allotted time or you will be in trouble. Then we will do something that Michael has done in a number of debates before. It's a fantastic way to get a lot of arguments out on the table quickly. We'll do cross-examination. Each person will have five minutes to cross-examine the person on the opposite side, and then they'll switch roles. After that, we're going to go to the Q&A in the middle of that debate, and then five-minute closing statements by each person, finishing about 4 p.m. Does that work for you all? All right. Get your questions in your mind. There'll be two mics. The trouble is I took uh, 1,100 people and uh, 20 minutes, which is 1,800 seconds or so. You have about three seconds per person. <laughs> so choose your spokespersons well. Let me then, for the first opening statement, invite to the podium Sean Carroll. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Before getting into the debatey part of the debate, I wanted to recognize that 
While it's absolutely true that we disagree, the two sides of the debate, we have things that are very, very important that should be clarified upon which we have very, very different points of view, it's also true that we come here for similar reasons. We share concerns. We're asking the same kinds of questions. What is the fundamental nature of reality? What is humankind's role in the cosmos? And this is why I will always remain stubbornly optimistic that through discussion and reason and rationality, we can actually make progress towards at least understanding, if not agreement, which is why I love uh, debates like this. I think that they are a very good thing to have. Having said that, religion and science have gone their separate ways over the years. 500 years ago, this debate would not have been held. There was no demarcation between what we would now call science and what we would call religion. There was just attempts to understand the world. And what happened is that science came about by developing techniques, methodologies for gaining reliable knowledge about the world. And the reliable knowledge that we got was incompatible with some of the presuppositions of religious belief. The basic thing that we learned by doing science for 400 years is something called naturalism. The idea that there is only one reality, that there are not separate planes of the natural and the supernatural, that there is only one material existence and we are part of the universe. We do not stand outside of it in any way. And the way that science got there is through basically realizing that human beings are not that smart. You are not Vulcans, you're not Mr. Spock, you're not perfectly logical. We as human beings are subject to all sorts of biases and cognitive shortcomings. We tend to be wishful thinkers and to see patterns where they're not there and so forth. And in response to this, science developed techniques for giving ourselves reality checks, for not letting us believe things that the evidence does not stand up to. One technique is simply skepticism, which you may have heard of. Scientists are taught that we should be our own theory's harshest critics. Scientists spend all their time trying to disprove their favorite ideas. This is a remarkable way of doing things that is a little bit counterintuitive, but helps us resist the lure of wishful thinking. The other technique is empiricism. We realize that we are not smart enough to get true knowledge about the world just by thinking about it. We have to go out there and look at the world. And what we've done by this for the last 400 years is to realize that human beings are not separate, that the world is one thing, the natural world, and it can be understood. This is very counterintuitive. This is not at all obvious, this naturalism claim. When you talk to a person, they have thoughts and feelings and responses. When you talk to a dead person, a corpse, I hate to be morbid here, but you don't get those same responses, those same thoughts and feelings. It's very natural, very commonsensical to think that a living person possesses something that a corpse does not, some sort of spirit, some sort of animating soul or life force. But this idea, as it turns out, does not stand up to closer scrutiny. And a big step towards realizing this was made back in the 1600s by a remarkable woman named Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. They made princesses differently back in the 17th century. <laughs> Elizabeth carried on a years-long correspondence with Rene Descartes, who famously tried to develop a theory of mind-body dualism. And Elizabeth said, I don't understand what you're saying, because if you really believe that the mind is in a separate realm from the body, my mind makes a choice to lift my arm, but it's my body that does it. How does the immaterial mind that you say doesn't exist at a location in space, how does it act causally on the body? How does it interact with the stuff out of which you are made? And Descartes never came out up with a reliable, believable response to this objection. Of course, these days, the objection is enormously stronger. We would say, you are made of atoms. You are made of cells, which are made of molecules, which are made of atoms. And as physicists, we know how atoms behave. The laws of physics governing the behavior of atoms are completely understood. You put an atom in a certain set of circumstances. If you tell me what those circumstances are, as a physicist, I will tell you what the atom will do. If you believe that the atoms that are inside your brain and your body act differently because they are in a living person than if they are in a rock or a crystal, then what you're saying is that the laws of physics are wrong, that they need to be altered because of the influence of a spirit or a soul or something like that. And that may be true. Science can't disprove that, but there is no evidence for it. And you get a much stronger explanatory framework by assuming that it's just atoms obeying the laws of physics. 
that kind of reasoning is a big step toward naturalism. Another big step also happened in the 1600s when Galileo came upon the idea of conservation of momentum. And you might say, why does conservation of momentum get in the way of my belief in the existence of God? But it does. Because before Galileo came along, physics was described by Aristotle. And Aristotle said something very, again, something very obvious and commonsensical, that if you want something to keep moving, you need to push it. Things naturally come to rest, left to their own devices. And, but if you look at the world, you realize that things are moving all over the place. So Aristotle very logically eventually concluded that you need to invoke the existence of an unmoved mover, which can be identified, of course, with God. But then, of course, Galileo comes along and says, actually, the natural behavior of matter is to keep moving at a constant velocity. Motion is perfectly natural. When things stop, it's because you are acting on them through friction or air resistance or dissipation. And then Isaac Newton comes along and builds an elaborate edifice of mechanics, which explains the world beautifully in purely material principle. And it's very, very interesting. Once that happened, you realize that the prime mover argument doesn't work as well, and you can actually see a change in the theological literature of the time. Before Newton and Galileo, there was emphasis put on ideas of prime movers and first causes, arguments from cosmology and contingency and so forth. After Newton and Galileo, the argument emphasized something else, the argument from design. People would say, well, sure, you can explain the planets moving, that's easy, but all of the life forms, the marvelous diversity of life here on Earth, that had to be made by some guiding external intelligence. In fact, in the 1700s, Immanuel Kant said, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. Then, of course, in the 1800s, we got an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. His name was Charles Darwin. Darwin showed how material, matter, all by itself, without guidance, without purpose, without an aim, just by the natural motion of ordinary things, can lead to the marvelous diversity of organic life that we see here on Earth. That was another huge step in the direction of naturalism. Now, of course, I could go on. We could talk about modern cosmology and the origin of the universe. We could talk about neuroscience and what consciousness is and so forth. But I don't want to do that right now. We can maybe talk about it later. But I don't want to do it right now basically because it's kind of boring. And the reason why it's kind of boring is because the argument is finished. The debate is over. We've come to a conclusion. Naturalism has won. If you go to any university physics department, listen to the talks they give or the papers they write, Go to any biology department, go to any neuroscience department, any philosophy department, people whose professional job it is to explain the world, to come up with explanatory frameworks that match what we see. No one mentions God. There's never an appeal to a supernatural realm by people whose job it is to explain what happens in the world. Everyone knows that the naturalist explanations are the ones that work. And yet, here we are. We're having a debate. Why are we having a debate? Because, clearly, religion speaks to people for reasons other than explaining what happens in the world. Most people who turn to religious belief do not do so because they think it provides the best theory of cosmology or biology. They turn to religious belief because it provides them with purpose and meaning in their lives, with a sense of right and wrong, with a community, with hope. So if we want to say that science has refuted religion, we need to say that science has something to say about those issues. And on that, I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that the universe does not care about you. <laughs> Qua universe. Don't take up my time. I'm in a hurry here. The universe is made of elementary particles that don't have intelligence, don't pass judgment, do not have a sense of right and wrong. And the fear is, the existential anxiety is, that if that purpose and meaningfulness is not given to me by the universe, then it cannot exist. The good news is that that fear is a mistake, that there is another option, that we create purpose and meaning in the world. If you love somebody, it is not because that love is put into you by something outside. It's because you created that from inside yourself. If you act good to somebody, it's not because you're given instructions to do so. It's because that's a choice that you made. This is a very scary world. You should be affected at a very deep level by the thought that the universe doesn't care, does not pass judgment on you. But it's also challenging and liberating that we can create lives that are worth living. I've never met God. I've never met any spirits or any angels. 
but I've met human beings, many of them are amazing people, and I truly believe that if we accept the universe for what it is, if we approach reality with an open mind and an open heart, then we can create lives very much worth living. Thank you. As Ian Hutchinson comes to the podium, I want to thank the Intercollegiate Studies Institute for co-sponsoring the speakers on my left for today's debate, and the San Diego area philanthropist, Don Daniels, who has made it possible. Thank you very much. Ian. Thank you for your welcome and hospitality here. I'm an applied physicist. I have a tremendously high regard for science. I think it's an amazingly powerful way to find out about the world insofar as it behaves reproducibly and can be described in ways that are unambiguously clear. Nevertheless, it seems to me rather obvious that it is not the case that science has refuted religion. Actually, I suspect it's probably impossible for science to refute religion. But let me try to engage the arguments. When Richard Dawkins says the existence of God is a scientific hypothesis like any other, I think he holds forth the foremost fallacy of the 21st century anti-theist arguments. Surely the existence of God, of all questions, might come first to mind as an example of something that is not a scientific hypothesis. So why do folks like Dawkins assert that it is? Well, I think it's because they subscribe to the philosophical doctrine of scientism, the erroneous belief that all the real knowledge there is, is science. Scientism is extremely widespread in the academy and society today, though it generally goes unannounced and unrecognized. And my book, Monopolizing Knowledge, explores its history, its justification, and its effects. I show the bankruptcy of scientism's arguments and the per pernicious influence that it has on society. Scientism actually harms science itself by provoking a justified rejection by non-scientific disciplines like history or literature or philosophy and so on. And this feeds an ongoing warfare often referred to as the culture wars or the science wars. The way out of this unprofitable confrontation of science with lots of other approaches to understanding the world, including religion, is to realize that science and scientism aren't the same thing. Science is not all the real knowledge there is. Scientism is not a finding of science, nor does it follow from science. It's an unproven presumption. And since scientism isn't demonstrated by science, it's a self-contradictory presumption. Now, the bearing of scientism on today's debate is this. My skeptical opponents, I am sure, are going to assert throughout this debate that there's no evidence supporting religious belief, or something like that. And what they're going to mean, even if they don't say it, is that there's no scientific evidence supporting religion. Actually, that's not even true. Um, there are quite a few features of our scientific knowledge of the natural world that do favor the existence of God. But even if there were no scientific evidence supporting Christianity, say. That wouldn't amount to a refutation of it. In fact, Christians have throughout the centuries asserted that there is evidence to support their beliefs, but that that evidence is mostly not scientific. It's historical, testimonial, documentary, philosophical, and personal. A strong argument can be made, although I'm not going to have time to make it now, that this is just the sort of evidence that one would expect to find for God. So that's my first general point. The skeptical arguments rest on scientism, not science, and specifically on a scientistic exclusion of the most relevant types of evidence. Now, in fairness, there actually are some sorts of religious claims that are refuted by science. 
Some people in the 16th and 17th century um, thought that the Bible taught that the earth is stationary while the sun moves through the sky. Modern science has shown that that belief is false. But the stationary earth interpretation of the Bible, as Galileo himself argued, was not the only or the most natural one, nor was it ever a foundational part of Christian religious doctrine. So the solar system is hardly a refutation of religion. The sorts of questions on which science speaks with authority are questions about the normal course of events, like orbiting planets. But many skeptics argue something like this. Science shows that miracles don't occur, therefore a religion like Christianity, in which miracles are inherently part of the religious claims, is refuted. What's more, the argument goes on, if God can't independently act in the world, because he's constrained by the laws of physics, God is undetectable and religion is completely irrelevant. My response to this is straightforward. The premise is untrue. Science simply hasn't disproved the possibility of miracles or of God acting in the world. Science, by definition, is, is addressing the normal course of events, and miracles are, again, practically by definition, not the normal course of events. Science is incompetent to pr disprove their possibility. Science might be able to indicate that some specific event was compatible with normal science, and, and that might lead one to discount its miraculous character. But since miracles are inherently one-off events, not generally susceptible to repeatable observations or experiments, science is usually incapable of investigating them. I mean, do you folks think that people in the first century Palestine were ignorant of the fact that water turning into wine just doesn't happen? Or that stilling a storm by a simple command can't be done? Do they think it's only because of modern science that we know these things are impossible? Nonsense. It's precisely because people knew perfectly well 2,000 years ago that such things don't generally happen, that they are miraculous. You might think that miracles don't occur, but if so, that belief doesn't rest upon modern science. Science logically adds nothing to the question one way or the other. And by the way, I happen to know that miracles do occur because I've seen them. Skeptics at their best realize that science doesn't logically decide the question of whether or not everything happens by the laws of physics. So there's a different argument that they offer. It is that the effective practice of science requires one to believe that the universe is closed and that the laws of physics are inviolable because otherwise science is somehow stopped. To believe otherwise, they say, leads to a kind of lazy, premature satisfaction with unsatisfactory answers like, God did it. This pragmatic ar argument deserves a pragmatic answer. It is that history shows it plainly to be false. It simply was not the presumption of the natural philosophers who, who founded the scientific revolution and carried it forward for the next two and a half centuries that the laws of physics are obeyed universally without exception. The vast majority of them were orthodox Christian believers and accepted miracles. So therefore, many of the most effective scientists of history, the heroes of science in fact, accepted miracles. Um, they didn't believe the laws of nature to be inviolable, and it's not a necessary presupposition of science. Another important Christian affirmation that is often assaulted in the name of science is the belief that the universe is created by God. Skeptics would argue that we now know that the universe and the earth um, is far older than the biblical creation story implies, that we now have a pretty comprehensive general knowledge of the universe's development over the last 13.7 billion years, and God is ruled out, or at least God is unnecessary. Now, in my view, the scientific evidence for an old earth and universe is completely overwhelming. So the question then is, does an old universe refute religion? I hope it's already obvious that an old universe doesn't refute religion in general. But then the skeptics might say, 
well, at least it refutes the religion based on the Bible. Well, uh, depends what you mean by based on the Bible. If you think that a literal interpretation of the first few chapters of Genesis is essential, um, that the Bible, in that sense, must be taken literally as teaching a, a creation in six literal days, 24 hours, then yes, actually, I do think that is refuted. But that's not the historic view of Christianity. Church fa fathers like Augustine, who fully accepted the authority of Scripture, recognized that the Genesis stories couldn't be se taken simply as literal. Augustine strongly cautioned Christians against such interpretations. And the church has long recognized that the Bible should not be treated like a science book. So it's, in my view, completely unconvincing to set up a minority straw man of literalistic interpretation of the Bible, say that it is refuted by science, and then conclude that religion or, or Christianity as a whole is refuted. So with my little time left, uh, let me turn... Sorry, that's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> work it in. Now the second speaker in the affirmative, Mr. Michael Shermer. So I will affirm the statement that science has refuted religion and throw God in there because they're always uh, intertangled that way by explaining what we know about why people believe in God and why people commit to faiths and religions and the evolutionary origins of religion, behavior, genetics, anthropology, archaeology, all in 10 minutes. So, <laughs> uh, so I'll just start with uh, just a section from my book. If you happen to have been born in the United States in the 20th century, there's a good chance that you are a Christian who believes that Yahweh is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe who maintained, manifested into flesh through Jesus of Nazareth. If you happen to be born in India in the 20th century, there's a very good chance that you are a Hindu who believes that Brahma is the unchanging, infinite, transcendent creator of all matter, energy, and time and space, and who manifests into flesh through Ganesha, the blue elephant god who is the most worshipped deity in India. To an anthropologist from Mars, all earthly religions would be indistinguishable at this level of analysis. So what I'm arguing is that uh, there are certain common elements that come through that are obviously uh, culturally bound. So where you just happen to be born determines uh, which religion you are uh, a part of. So explaining it in a way refutes it in the sense, different than it would be if it was, say, I'm explaining why people vote Republican or why people vote Democratic, something like that. Because we know those are made up categories. Religions are making different claims. They're making absolute claims to truth. And therefore, the explanation that there's a cultural, behavioral genetics origin of it then, I think, provides positive evidence that we made God and religions, not vice versa. For example, flood myths show similar cultural uh, influence. The Epic of Gilgamesh, which predates by centuries the Noachian flood story, tells exactly the same story. And anthropologists tell us that cultures that are uh, uh, next to large bodies of water that flood tend to have flood myth stories. Virgin birth myths are likewise spring up throughout the ages. Uh, among those alleged to have conceived without the usual assistance of a male <laughs> include Dionysus, Perseus, Buddha, Attis, Krishna, Horus, Mercury, Romulus, and of course, Jesus. Consider the parallels between Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine, and Jesus of Nazareth. Both were said to have been born of a virgin mother who was a mortal woman, but were fathered by the king of heaven. Both allegedly returned from the dead, transformed water into wine, and introduced the idea of eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the Creator, and both were said to have been the liberator of mankind. For some reason, there's like that Joseph Campbell stuff about recurring myths that happen again and again, perhaps a part of our a product of our brains, of our culture, some combination. There are resurrection, resurrection myths, same thing. There's lots and lots of resurrection stories that well predate the Christ story, like Osiris. Uh, the god of Egypt that was said to have died and come back, just like the sun goes down and comes back. And initially, only the pharaoh gets to be resurrected, but the Egyptians cleverly decided that if everybody can be resurrected by believing in the god king, including the pharaoh, you can get a lot of free labor to build <laughs> monuments. Uh, so in that sense, then, I think, let's take a look back at the origins of religion and god belief. So first of all, 
uh, we're pattern seeking uh, primates. We look to uh, connect the dots to explain things in the world. God is the ultimate pattern connection device. It explains everything. And we also uh, tend to infuse these patterns with agency, intentional agents uh, that are invisible and run the world, control things, they control the weather, angels and demons and aliens and poltergeists and, and gods. Uh, the, these are just things we infuse uh, from about the age of several months old into objects that we think of them as intentional agents. We know from behavioral genetic studies that roughly 40 to 50 percent of the variants on people's religious beliefs are accounted for by genes. That is, your inheritance, your um, propensity to believe this versus that is explained by your genetics. Now, it's not that there's a gene for Catholicism or baptism, ba Baptist or something like that. It's that certain religions appeal to certain kinds of temperaments that are genetically programmed. So just like some people tend to prefer to vote liberal, others to vote conservative, in part, at least half, because of their personalities and temperament and the kind of political parties they prefer. Same thing with religion. Some religions tend to, to offer more that, that we like. So you know God is man-made and religions are man-made when they happen to, to like and hate the same people you like and hate. It's a little too convenient and obviously culturally bound. So before civilization, we evolved in these small bands of hunter-gatherers of a couple dozen to a couple hundred individuals where everybody either knows one another or is related to one another. So in that sense, you don't really need religion as a moral force. People just get along because they have to. There's usually some means of conflict resolution uh, because if you're going to spend your whole life with these people, you've got you to gotta get along, right? Around three to 5,000 years ago, these bands and tribes began to coalesce into these larger chiefdoms and states. In, in, in that scenario, the normal informal means of behavior control and enforcing the rules don't work because there's too many opportunities for free riding, cheating the system. So in that sense, two institutions rose uh, in which um, governments gave everybody a copy of the rules and said, these are the rules, you obey them or else, here's the penalty. And the second institution said, if you think you got away with it, you didn't because there's an invisible eye in the sky that sees everything, knows everything, and in the next life, it'll all be settled. Uh, and so these are uh, religion and governments. Both arose about the same time, and until uh, the founding of the American experiment, they were always completely intertwined. Politicians and political leaders used the force of religion to gain uh, extra power of connectedness to something higher power that would uh, put fear into the people and that sort of thing. So, um, and so we know from lots of research that um, from a comparative world religions, from anthropology, from archaeology, that uh, the idea of a big god doesn't really even start until around that time, three to 5,000 years ago, when these societies became too large for these informal means of behavior control. So we think that religion probably evolved as a mechanism of social cohesion, keeping the group together. We're all in this together. Um, it's a way, so religious rituals are a way of signaling to your fellow group members, you can count on me. If you see me every, every Friday wearing the yarmulke or Saturday or Sunday in the pews, it, not eating meat or eating fish or whatever it is the ritual is, doesn't matter what the rituals are. The doing of the ritual is what's called a co costly signal. That I can afford to do this extra little thing as a signal to you that I'm a reliable group member. So when I'm in trouble, I can count on you. And when you're in trouble, you can count on me. And, and religions were among the first organizations to do that. It's called social capital. Now, Dinesh may make the argument, yeah, but religion is good for people. It makes them more moral, they're healthier, and so on. Well, that may be. Um, but what we're looking at here is by deconstructing it, well, what is it that makes people obey the rules if they think they're being watched? You know the experiments where if you put a pair of eyes, just a picture of a pair of eyes above a tip jar next to the donut thing at the office, people are more likely to give the tip. If you put a mirror, they're more likely to put in the tip jar. It isn't that you need a God. It's the sense that my actions have consequences because people know what I'm doing. This is why tweeting the revolution on Facebook is a great idea. Evil happens in secrecy. And so the more, the less secrecy we have, the more of those cameras. I don't like, libertarians don't like cameras, but cameras are actually good to squelch evil because people are watching. So it's not that religion has a monopoly on that. They were the first to exploit that idea. The invisible eye in the sky is watching you. But as we've seen from 
uh, Northern European countries that have pretty much the reverse of the percentages of belief that we have. Maybe 10 to 20 percent believe in God in the rest of Scandinavia, countries Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and so on. Uh, and they get along just fine. They have much lower rates of crime uh, and abortion and STDs and suicide rates than Americans do. So one question is, is if religion is so great, then how come we have amongst the highest rates of social ills compared to these northern European countries? Now the answer has to, you have to get into politics and economics and sociology and all that, but, 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 but it's not religion, that's the point of this. So by deconstructing what religions do, like on the question of are religious people healthier, maybe, but what is it that makes them healthy? Well, it turns out that just having more self-control, having a social network of somebody that is a friend or a partner to remind you, don't forget to take your vitamins, don't forget to brush your teeth, don't forget to go to the doctor, don't forget to get the check. Those are the sorts of things, don't have the extra cheesecake. Those are the sorts of things that makes people healthier and it's just social capital and I would argue that in the last 500 years or so, religion has been uh, withering away on that front, except for in America, but uh, everywhere else in, in Europe and in countries affected by the Enlightenment, that has been the effect of that. And so I think then we can affirm the, the statement that science has refuted religion. Thank you. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, the second speaker to deny the affirmative, Mr. Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you very much. Wow. The, it's very interesting to be in an audience that tends for the most part to have a singular point of view. And that's because in listening to the chuckles and snickers and instinctive responses of that audience, it's very easy to spot its hidden prejudices. The hidden prejudices are not obvious because they're shared. Everybody laughs at the same thing. It's kind of like if I went to the Democratic Convention and I mentioned Reagan, everyone would laugh because they all would think he's an idiot. Or if I go to the Republican Convention and mention Obama, I don't have to make an argument. Everybody already agrees that he's a fool. So one of the real marks of intelligence is not to be able to look at the other guy and chuckle at his blind spots, but to be able to turn your mind on yourself and ask what are the hidden assumptions of my own point of view that I'm likely to be more blind toward because they are invisible to me. Here we are flung into the world and we are facing, as if we are going to be thoughtful about it, some very key and fundamental questions that are very difficult to answer. Why is there a world? Why is there a universe? What are we doing here? Where are we going? What's going to come after we die? What's the point of being here in the first place? I don't think it's possible to be an intelligent human being and not consider these questions to be important. They have to do with what our life is all about and what this world is all about. Now, for science to refute religion, it needs to consider the religious answer to these questions and provide a better answer. But in fact, the scientific answer to all the questions I've just mentioned is the following. Don't have a clue, don't have a clue, don't have a clue, and don't have a clue. Why is there a universe? There's no scientific answer to that question. Why are we here? There's no answer to that question either. What's going to happen to us after we, di we die? Science has no clue. So the fact of the matter is that science is facing questions. Now, I agree that they are factual questions in some sense. Whether there's life after death or not is a factual question. But it's a very difficult empirical question to answer for the simple reason that we can't talk to dead guys. We can't go to the other side of the curtain. In some sense, death is an impassable barrier for us empirically. Presumably, if there's life after death, one day we will know the, the answer to whether or not which side of that question was empirically right in the first place. But science, if it claims to know what comes after death, is not only going beyond science, but engaging in the most ignorant dogmatism that can be imagined, comparable to the foolishness of any mindless fundamentalist. 
Science is claiming to know what it absolutely does not know. This is the worst kind of dogmatism made even more culpable if it is in engaged by intelligent people who should know better. Presumably there's a group of people who say we act on faith. We're believers. Remember that those people don't even claim to be knowers. They're believers. But if you claim to be science guys, you claim to be guided by facts, by knowledge, by careful empiricism, so don't be led into pretending to have the answers that you manifestly don't have. Now the argument that science has refuted religion is not only uh, not a factual statement, it's an argument that it really relies on a historical kind of argument, which Sean Carroll alluded to. It's a kind of a story that science is advancing and religion is retreating. And I want to look at the key, this story really rests on a sort of, th on a tripod of examples. Key examples, the flat earth. The, the religious people believe the earth is flat and the brilliant scientists showed up to prove it's round. Uh, the, the, the religious people believe the earth is the center of the universe and the, the smart scientists produce telescopes that showed it's not so. The religious people believe that God created each creature unto its kind, but then Darwin, uh, the sort of patron saint of modern science, uh, turned up to prove that no, evolution uh, can explain it all, and so on. I want to I look at this historical story because actually it is part of a 19th century propaganda war against science. Let's start with the idea of the flat earth. The fact of the matter is that educated people throughout the Middle Ages, and in fact going back to the time of Christ, knew perfectly well that the earth is round. The ancient Greeks, who lived 500 years before Christ, knew that the earth is round. Greek philosophers calculated the circumference of the earth in the 5th century BC. And in fact, to know that the earth is round, you don't need wonderful telescopes, you don't need Galileo, all you need to do is go watch an eclipse. Here's the sun, here's the earth, here's the moon. You can see the shadow of the earth on the moon. Hey fellas, it's round. <laughs> so, the idea that science has refuted some great religious myth is itself a myth. What about the idea of evolution? I must say as a Christian, if I read the first book of Genesis, it seems clearly asserted that God made the universe and God made life. But the Bible doesn't say how. So it could have been done in one of two ways. God could have decided, I'll do it all by perpetual miracle. I'll create every creature individually, one by one. Or God could have said, I'll be like a clever engineer and make a universe that works by laws. It's kind of like saying instead of making every car individually, I'll make a factory that produces cars. Either way, either way, there's a reflection of two different ways that God could have done it. He could have done it directly or he could have done it by law. The Bible doesn't say which way was used. And it seems to me evolution is perfectly compatible with the understanding that God made the laws that produce our world, our natural world, and we who are in fact part of that world. Now although evolution is often used as a battering ram against Christianity, and it's really only a battering ram against a tiny wing of fundamentalist Christianity, sort of young earth Christianity, the idea that the, that the world is 6,000 years old, and so on. That's a very tiny wing of Christianity, let alone of all religion. One of the things that's very striking to me in the opening statements is how little educated references are made to other religions. For example, the Hindus believe in reincarnation. There's a study at the University of Virginia, it's about 40 years old, of tens of thousands of cases of reported reincarnation that are investigated by researchers who go and talk to people who claim to actually have lived previous lives, often 100 miles or 300 miles from where they are born. Again, this is an empirical question. Are these people lying? I've written critically of this evidence, but it doesn't seem to me that my opponents are even aware of it. For science to refute religion is to have to, at the beginning, show some awareness of what religious claims are, and to be able to actually produce some counter evidence that these claims are actually false. Nothing like that is even being attempted here. What is being done, rather, 
is a kind of appeal to prejudice. We all know that those religious people are fools. We all know that they've just made up a bunch of stuff. We all know that the majority of mankind is deluded, and so on. Now, wait a minute. I recognize, I recognize that beliefs are culture-bound. But this is no less true of scientific beliefs also. Somebody who is born, somebody who is born in New Guinea is much less likely by virtue of that fact to believe in evolution than someone who is born in New York City. Someone who is born in Oxford, Mississippi is less likely to believe in Darwin than someone who is born in Oxford, England. But what do these cultural facts say about whether those beliefs are true? Nothing. They don't tell you one way or the other at all. To know who's right, you've got to consider the merits of the argument. And that is what my opponents consistently fail to do. They just appeal to, to your prejudices, to where you were born, to where you were educated. They appeal ultimately to the kind of shared knowledge that makes you laugh, counting on the fact that they're getting not truth, but mere cultural agreement in this room. That is actually not intellectual argument at all. It's a certain kind of demagoguery. Science will only refute religion when it can lay out the factual claims of religion and prove, A, there is no God, B, there is no life after death, C, there is no soul, D, there is no free will, and I ask you, have my opponents even begun to do that? The answer, I think, is obvious. Thank you. Thank you for that set of brilliant opening statements. Ladies and gentlemen, classical debate now doubles the tempo. The, re the uh, refutations are given now in five-minute segments, responding to the most meritorious arguments from the other side and showing that one's own side is the most rationally compelling. Five minutes then, each speaker, Sean Carroll. I once read a, uh, an amazing article by a woman, I'm, I'm sorry I forget her name, I wish I could quote her name, but she was for a long time a major player in the New Age movement, and sort of mysticism and Age of Aquarius type stuff. And one of the reasons why she uh, felt that that was the right place to be was because she thought that scientists were arrogant. That they had all these answers to questions they didn't have any right to have answers to. But with her New Age friends, she would sometimes raise questions about their beliefs. And she noticed a pattern emerging, talking to her New Age friends versus talking to scientists, that scientists would sometimes say they didn't know the answer to something and that her new age friends would never say that. They had an answer for everything. And she realized actually science does claim to know the answer to some things, but there are other things that it very quickly admits it doesn't know the answer to. Dinesh just gave you a list, a laundry list of things. Where did the universe come from? Why is there any universe? Is there life after death? And he says, and science has no clue about any of these things, as if that's a bad thing. Scientists are extremely proud of the fact that we know we know some things, and we know there are other things we don't know. We know where the dividing line is between what we know and what we don't know because of good reasons. For why there is a universe rather than not, we don't know the answer to that. Is there life after death? We know the answer to that. Why? Because we know what we're made of. We know how it acts. We know there is nothing to keep any sort of soul alive after the body dies. And that goes back to Ian's discussion of how does science know some things? Is science the only way of knowing things? Science is clearly not the only way of knowing things. There are other ways of truth. For example, mathematical truths are outside of science. They are logical truths, not empirical ones. But it would be a mistake to think that religion is a different way of obtaining truth that is outside everything else. In fact, religious people have exactly the same epistemic, epistemic standards as non-religious people do, except when they're talking about religion. They would, Ian didn't actually give you a reason to believe that God exists. He just said that it's outside the realm of science to talk about it. 
But then when he really wanted to make a point, he said, you know, I, I believe in miracles, for example, I've seen them. Data, experimental evidence is ultimately what matters. Does science make assumptions as it doesn't need to make? One of the arguments against science from uh, the religious side of things is that science assumes from the start there is no supernatural realm or there's perfect regularity among the laws of nature, but that's simply not true. A scientist, if they were faced with something that was manifestly supernatural or a deviation from the regularities we observed in nature, we would try to understand that. We would not say, I, I just can't deal with that. I don't know what to do. We would <laughs> approach it using the methods of science. The only assumption that science makes is that the world is not trying to trick us, that we are not a brain in a bat being taunted by a mad scientist, that we can more or less trust our sensory data, and we look for patterns in that data. Could there be miracles? Of course there could be. But you're faced with two worldviews, one of which that says that those eyewitness testimonies that Dinesh mentions of people who are regressing to past lives are mistaken. The other worldview says that all of the laws of physics that we think we know are wrong. And that's the choice you need to make. And the decision that we make is based on the same criteria we would always make. And imagine, let's just, let's just imagine that people who believed in God took that hypothesis, that idea, if you don't want to call it a theory or hypothesis, that's okay, that idea, just as seriously as scientists took their theory. What they would do is try to be skeptical about it. Can we disprove this? Can we use it to make a prediction and compare that to the data? And a lot of people talk about the problem of evil. My favorite problem is the problem of instructions. I am personally a textbook author. I have read Amazon.com reviews of my textbook. But if I were God, my textbook would be perfect. If God existed, the one thing that if there, it were, there were an omnipotent being that cared about us here on Earth, I would expect clear instructions. I would expect a book that I knew exactly what it said. It was clear that it was right, and I would be able to follow it. If God did not exist, I would expect all sorts of different books. They would contradict each other. Some of them would be brilliant in parts. They would be silly in other parts. They would be uplifting in parts. They would be uh, very depressing in other parts. They would be edited collections. They would be personal memoirs. They would all disagree with each other. Which of these two theories fits the data? Thank you. <laughs> Ian Hutchinson, rebuttal number two. You know, I think Michael made a mistake about what the debate is about. Almost nothing he said was about science. He talked about why do people believe. He gave you stories that um, describe Gilgamesh and flood stories and virgin births and Dionysus. None of this is science, OK? Uh, then he offered us a few genetic thoughts, um, but quickly moved on to talk about how um, people's opinions, uh, people's political beliefs, people's religious beliefs by implication uh, and by direction uh, b began to be sustained uh, by religion um, three to 5,000 years ago. If, what is it he really means? Are we, in fact, genetically determined in our beliefs? If so, that must have happened hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years ago. If it's actually only three to 5,000 years ago, then he's, again, not talking about science. He's talking about uh, social development, society changing, and he's calling that evolution, and pretending that it is equivalent to biological evolution. So practically nothing that he told us about is about science. And let, let me therefore take my opportunity to say the points that I didn't get to make at the beginning, because he is making the claim that religion has ex been explained away by science as a purely natural phenomenon. The first thing uh, to recognize, of course, is that the religious impulse is undoubtedly essentially a, a universal human phenomenon. That raises no problems for religion. Uh, it's just what you would expect to be the case if there really is a God. So that's point number one about explaining religion away. Second, sociobiology and evolutionary psychology, which are very popularly put forward today as explanations of religion, um, 
basically are dominated by the kind of speculative storytelling that we just heard, whose content is really a reflection more of the speakers, of the storytellers' prior commitments than it is the possibility of new discovery. It has almost none of the confirmatory scientific evidence that biological evolution does. And that's one reason why the scientific community, including very many evolutionary biologists, are so critical of it. The third point is that psychological analyses, whether they're evolutionary based or otherwise, don't tell us whether or not beliefs are true. For example, Richard Dawkins might say that someone believes in God because his parents taught them, or because it comforts him to do so, or because uh, he was programmed by evolution to do it. I might say that Richard Dawkins doesn't believe in God because his parents taught him that way, or because it serves his particular desires for personal liberty not to believe, or because he was programmed not to by evolution. Both sets of claims are equally convincing or unconvincing as one another. Fourthly, let me say this as an aphorism. Why should the belief that beliefs are determined by evolution be believed? I mean, the point is, if human beliefs are determined by evolution, then science is just as much refuted as religion. So these psychological uh, proofs don't work. Sean has really um, confused the issue in respect to science by, by implying that any time there's an experience, any time there's data, the way is the way he calls it, that turns something into a science. Is something a science because there, it's factual? No, that's not uh, necessarily the case at all. Um, it's, not, it's simply a misunderstanding of what science is to imply that anything that has got um, factual content or common content is science. Science as we inherited it from the scientific revolution focuses on understanding the world in so far as it behaves reproducibly. This requires us, for example, if someone does an experiment in one place at one time, that someone else should be able to come and do the same experiment some other time, somewhere else, and get the same result. That's the experimental reproducibility on which science has to be based. Thank you, Ian. And now for the second rebuttal for the affirmative, Michael Schirmer. Good debate, sharp arguments for our other side. So the gloves have to come off. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> hidden assumptions, well, of course, we all have uh, assumptions. Uh, with science, we assume there is a, a physical world and we can know something about it. Uh, maybe not perfectly, but we can approximate it through some reliable method in which it's not just up to me, but that you too can check it the same way I did. And unless we have a collective hallucination amongst all the labs, then we are at least making some progress uh, along the pathway toward matching our perceptions uh, with the way we think the world really is. Now, unless you're, let's say, in a debate with somebody like Deepak Chopra, who I was in a debate with two weeks ago at his little place down in San Diego, I mean, he argues that um, my assumption that brain activity causes consciousness and mind is foundational, fundamental, and biased just as much as his, that consciousness creates brains and matter, and that they're equal, they're equal footing. And my counter to that is, no, they're not equal, because we have lots of empirical evidence to support the one claim, even if it's not completely understood how neurochemical activity gives rise to what we're doing here now, like experiencing things. The fact that we can't fully explain it doesn't mean the two theories are on equal footing. We have lots of evidence, for example, if you destroy the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobe, people can't see faces, they're face blind. 
If you stimulate that area, they spontaneously see faces. In specific areas, they stimulation, they see teeth. Um, it's weird. Uh, and, <laughs> but we know this is true. If you destroy the T1 of the visual cortex area, people lose conscious perception of visual stimulation right in, in that particular area. Uh, so we, we know that stimulation of the one brain gives rise to something that we call mind, even though it's just brain activity. We have no evidence at all that somehow consciousness gives rise to matter. They're, they're not equal. And, and so that my point is that saying that science is another belief like religion or, or the, uh, they're sort of on equal footing is not the case. It's a little bit like alternative medicine. There, there's no such thing. There's just medicine. The, the, okay, what do you call alternative medicine that has evidence? Medicine. <laughs> By the way, because this always comes up in God debates, you know, love, God. What do you call love without evidence? Stalking. <laughs> now, Dinesh mentioned uh, the fact that the fact that there's different percentages of belief depending on where you're born and so on is, is a good point. It's true. Forty-five percent of Americans believe that the Earth was created uh, about six thousand years ago, as Sam Harris likes to say, about a thousand years after the Babylonians invented beer. And about 45% of Americans think that um, God used evolution to create a life, and about 10% of Americans uh, are right. <laughs> the fact, the percentage, it's true, the percentages are irrelevant. You have, there has to be some other method, and that's what science does. It creates a different method of, 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 of getting past these particular biases. My point in constructing all those arguments, uh, by the way, anthropology, archaeology, sociology, psychology, evolutionary psychology, these are sciences, too. I know physicists don't like to think of that. <laughs> when I was doing that, I was doing science, even though it's social science. It's still science. Um, I think another way to think about this, um, OK, so what are we doing here? Uh, oh, by the way, what happens after we die? Well, what, where were you before you were born? OK, so the fact that I don't know for sure, it does not mean that the, the theory that there is an afterlife is equal to the theory that there is no afterlife. All the, the preponderance of evidence is that nothing happens, anything more than like where you were before you were born. So the default, the null hypothesis in science, which we always begin with, your hypothesis is not true until proven otherwise, we have to assume there, there is no afterlife until there's some evidence to the contrary. Accepted, testable, replicable, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, so in that sense, I think we can make a distinction, say, between, even though we can make a distinction between being an atheist, uh, you know, I, uh, I just don't believe in God, and an agnostic, uh, that it's not provable, or as Stephen Colbert told me when I was trying to explain the difference, agnostics are just atheists without balls, right? <laughs> um, it's true, nobody, nobody's an agnostic behaviorally. It's just sort of a technical question on the onto ontological question of God's existence. But in fact, we do make choices about how we act in the world. And having a scientific worldview, I think, uh, is a better perspective on the world than having a religious world worldview. Thank you. And now for the final talk of the rebuttal series, Denise D'Souza. Is there life on other planets? Truth of the matter is, we don't know. If somebody had said that science has refuted the notion that there's life on other planets, we would consider that to be a very dogmatic statement. That's because there is the real possibility of life on other planets, and the fact that we haven't found evidence for it doesn't disprove it. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Michael Shermer acts as if the fact that we don't know what comes after death proves that it must be that what comes after death is exactly the same as what was there before we were born. That is a huge and dogmatic assumption with no evidence to support it. It is not even a scientific position. It is, in fact, a philosophical position that he is not even bothering to defend because he assumes it agrees with your prejudices. Sean Carroll essentially gave away the whole debate when he came to the earlier premises of, of what science hasn't proved. And he goes, sure, 
We don't know why there's a universe. We don't know why we're here. We don't know what's going to come after. But we're proud that we don't know. In other words, we haven't refuted you. We are ignorant as you are. But we're going to claim we win anyway because we at least know we're ignorant. <laughs> now, first of all, first of all, this claim to epistemological modesty is largely bogus. The fact of the matter is that religious people, not all of them, I grant you, you have some self-righteous religious people, but when we say as religious people that we are believers, we are actually confessing to a certain kind of agnosticism. A believer is different than a knower. If I knew something, I wouldn't believe it. I, in other words, I, I believe that there's a place called Papua New Guinea. I trust maps. I've never been there, but I wouldn't say I believe in my brother, because I know the guy. <laughs> so belief falls short of knowledge. Belief acknowledges an element of faith. So the religious person in that sense is at least being epistemologically honest in saying, when it comes to life after death, on the basis of reason alone, I don't know, any more than Sean Carroll does. The difference between Sean Carroll and me is not that he has some data unavailable to me. The difference is that I will at least admit that my position on life after death affirming it is based on faith. He, poor atheist, is deluding himself into thinking that his denial of life after death is based on some kind of evidence. He hasn't produced any. He doesn't have any. Now, what about this idea that scientific explanation is the Forget the only, even the main form of explanation. Let's say I put some hot water, put some water into a stove, a pot, and I put it on the stove, and I turn it on. And then I bring in Sean Carroll, a scientist, and I say, give me the explanation of what's going on. And he gives the scientific explanation. The temperature rises, the molecules become excited, there's bubbling, and so on. And he describes the laws of physics, and so on. And that is one explanation, and it's a very valid explanation of what's happening. But here's a second explanation. Dinesh is trying to make a cup of tea. <laughs> now that is a second and a perfectly valid and in fact a needed explanation to give a full and accurate account of what's going on. To pretend that the scientific explanation is the only explanation is just plain ignorant. And the scientific explanation by itself would not suffice to give a full account of the empirical facts in front of us. Now, science too is based on a certain kind of faith. And it's really helpful when your ideas are based on assumptions to be aware of them. The underlying assumption of science is that reality is rational. That is not a scientific claim. It's an assumption. We can measure the speed of light all we want. What we don't know for a fact, except by assumption, that the speed of light is the same always and everywhere in the universe, and so it has been since the Big Bang. That's the assumption that drives our facts. The truth of it is that both science and religion are efforts to comprehend the great realities of life, to come to terms with them. In some areas, they overlap. But I would argue that they are both motivated by the same human skepticism and by the same human search for truth as science refuted religion, no more than religion has refuted science. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, two things are true. It's true that in 20 minutes, you come on to the two microphones to be able to pose your questions. I hope you'll be prepared. The next thing that's true is that probably the most dramatic part of the debate is the part that we're now moving into, the cross-examination. I would ask Sean to move to this podium, Ian to move to this podium. Sean owns the first five minutes. He can pose whatever questions he wants. Now the moderator will jump in if Ian either takes control or doesn't answer the questions. Uh, at the time when you feel you've had enough question, you can just stop, stop him. Say, here's my next question. So you're in control of the next five minutes. Our rigorous Teutonic timekeeper will make sure. At the end of five minutes, then, we reverse the roles. And Ian is in the, Ian is in the driver's seat. Sit forward and watch what happens. <laughs>
Okay, Ian, I want to start off with some hard-hitting questions. Do you believe in God? Yes. <laughs> Why? What is your best reason, your favorite reason? Put briefly. You know, I think there are at least five different categories of reasons why Pick your uh, favorite one would believe one. in God. Okay, uh, I, I will say that the most persuasive uh, argument for the truth of religion to me is the historical facts surrounding the person of Jesus Christ. So you, so you, uh, <laughs> you judge. But that's not the only reason. I, I, no, no, I understand, that's, that's fine. But you're judging that the historical um, evidence that we have, if I may use that word, for the divinity of Jesus is superior than the historical evidence that might be adduced for the divinity of other figures throughout history. Okay. What is your standard, your criteria for judging, making that judgment? Well, I'm not a historian, obviously, so is, 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 is that the, what you wanted to elicit? How, why, why is um, Jesus' divinity more believable than that of Buddha or Allah? Well, I, I, well, obviously, I think that the, the facts surrounding Jesus are extremely well attested. I think the New Testament uh, is a, a document that's been subject to the most exquisite analysis from all kinds of different points of view and has withstood that. Um, but also, I think that when you approach those kinds of evidences, you don't approach them at, with a blank slate. You approach them with an, a whole set of other arguments and ideas in mind. And so I think that in many ways the question arises to what extent not only do, does the historical interpretation of, the, let's say, the New Testament make sense of the New Testament, but also to what extent does it make sense of the world, the universe, our whole experience as individuals. So, so how, I, how is any of that different than the way that we make judgments in physics or archaeology or history? I think it's very different from the way we make judgments in physics. I How think, is it different? I think in physics, as you said yourself very, very clearly, we, we regard physics as requiring to be based on empirical uh, approach to, to experiment or observation. And I think that if you're talking about religion, we don't really think that religions can be, religious experience, for example, can be reproduced at will. In fact, anything that could be reproduced at will, you know, a religious person would say, of course that's not something about God, because after all, for, mo for us Christians, at any rate, we would say God is personal, and so our relationship with God isn't like another law of nature, it's actually something much more like a relationship. So, and so I'm, we, I'm a cosmologist, can I ask, do you think that cosmology is a science? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that the Big Bang is reproducible? I think because a lot of phenomena some, uh, that describe the Big Bang are repro reproducible. When we look out and make observations, there are hundreds or thousands or millions of different types of observations that we can make that go to create an, uh, an important picture. After all, astronomy is, in, in, is the first science, in a sense, of people, but precisely because it is reproducible. The beginning of the universe only happened once that we can observe, right? Of course. And yet we study it scientifically. It's not yes. reproducible. So I'm not so so, and and, that, and that's because it's a generality of the past rather than a particularity of the past. So it only happens once. Go, are you going to discount anybody's experience, a personal experience, simply because it can't be verified scientifically? Yes, no. Yeah, you, you'll, have a, you'll have a chance. <laughs> I think that it's you know I, I don't want to. I want to stick to questions, not answers, but I don't think that I've seen in anything that you've said, so maybe you can clarify it, why the uh, choices that I make about believing some piece of evidence for the divinity of one person or another is epistemically different from the choices I make about believing one scientific hypothesis about the early universe versus another. Singular events that only happened once, we have some data, we make choices on the basis of which data fits into a bigger picture. Look, either science means a special way of knowing or it means everything that is uh, known in some kind of systematic way. Historically, it's the latter that people really meant by science when they were back in the uh, early stages prior to the scientific revolution. Since the scientific revolution and today, we far more often mean by science those things that we explore in natural science. 
So the way I'm using the word science is by reference to natural science, and that's my explanation of the comment to Michael. When I if say science, out, let me very thank briefly, you, yes. Ian. Please join me and applause for the two. <laughs> it's an interesting genre, no? All right, we hand now the baton to Ian Hutchinson. Please go ahead. So Michael has offered us the view that e an evolutionary understanding of religion essentially refutes it. Um, and, and that's because it has a better un explanation of religion than religious people do. Um, do, do you agree with that? Uh, I'm not an expert on the evolutionary origin of religious belief. I, my way of thinking about things is that uh, well, naturalistic... Do, well, do you, do you actually believe that religion arose, at least in part, by Darwinian process? By... A Darwinian process. Uh, human beings arose by Darwinian processes, therefore, by definition, yes. Uh, okay, <laughs> fine. So, 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 uh, so, would you please give us some kind of scientific evidence that supports the hypothesis that religion arose as purely a Darwinian process? You know, again, you're, you're asking the wrong person. This is not my area of expertise. I, so I, you I don't, don't know of any? You don't know of any evidence? No, I mean, I, I, can, okay. I can certainly offer That's hypotheses. Fine. That's fine. That's Thank you very much. That's my job as a theoretical <laughs> physicist. Let me, let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me come to another one. Um, string theory seems to permit an now immense... We're on my you're on home ground. I'm, I'm deliberately asking him something he knows about, okay? String theory seems to permit an immense number of possible s solutions of which the universe we inhabit might be just one. Is that a fair state of current scientific th yes. thinking? Yes. Okay. Um, if string theory does actually turn out to describe our universe, would it then be fair to call it a law of physics? Yes. Okay. If our universe came into being in accordance with string th theory, do you have an explanation for where string theory came from? There may or may not be such an explanation. That's the kind of question which, as a scientist, we should say, okay, maybe... Okay, so the answer is no. Is that correct? <laughs> there may, yes or no. We don't know. All right. Um, doesn't this line of thought, though, uh, show that even if the universe did arise as an inflated quantum fluctuation, it doesn't bring to an end the scientific regress? It doesn't explain where the laws of physics came from. Isn't That's that That's right. So? There may or may not be an explanation. Okay, so doesn't that show that claims to be able to s explain scientifically where the universe or the laws of physics come from are completely hollow? No. <laughs> oh? I thought you just conceded that. No, I said there may or may not be an explanation. We will investigate the matter scientifically and find out where it leads. Okay. Um, one, one argument against the appeal to God as the final cause of the universe is to say that God is a more complex uh, concept to explain a simpler concept. Uh, you, you know what I'm referring to, I, I'm sure. And that one should ex uh, prefer a simpler explanation uh, and, and just, and therefore one should just sort of postulate the laws of physics, which is perhaps what you're willing to do. Um, do you think there's merit in that argument? Is that a reasonable argument? To be honest, I think that God is just a mess and is so ill-defined, it's hard to ap apply a, a value of complexity to it. So you don't think that God is more or less complex than I think the that God is too ill-defined to be judged as too complex. But if you so, force me... So in that case, you, you disavow the kinds of reputation of religion based on the observations concerning simplicity or complexity. Is that the case? If you gave me a sufficiently explicit and clear demonstration or, or explanation of what God is, then I would be able to judge it. Okay, well, I think you, you've, you've answered no. You've, uh, <laughs> you've, you've written um, that the basic scientific assumption is that there exists a complete and coherent description of, the, of how the world works. Um, I don't think what that's do you mean assumption. by complete? I, I don't think that is an assumption. I'm quoting you. I'm quoting you from why almost all cosmologists are atheists. The basic scientific assumption is that there is a, exists a complete and coherent description of how the world works. A description. I want to know what sorry, you mean you're right. by complete. I, I was right. Description rather than um, <laughs> immutable laws. The description might be one that changes from time to time. So, sure, yes, I, I agree with that. So, what do you mean by complete? Well, everything that happens. If you could, the, the dumbest but most accurate scientific theory would be just a list of everything that ever happened everywhere in the universe. Okay, so can, a, can science proceed, can a scientist proceed without making that assumption? 
I don't know what it would mean to not make that assumption. You'd be saying that there are things that didn't happen in the universe well, that are part okay, of the universe. Fine. So is, is, that, is that assumption consistent with, let's say, traditional Orthodox Christianity? Again, not my area. <laughs> yeah, so you refuse to answer? Uh, I, I don't want to speak for You're traditional Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would probably guess yes, but I would ask you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, it's not. Okay. Well, I allowed not. you one question, you allowed me one question. So did Ladies James and Scott gentlemen, please join me in thanking our two <laughs> debaters. I'll ask Dinesh and Michael to say, now do you see how the genre works a little bit? Michael has the first five minutes. Please go. Dinesh, uh, in the uh, sea of almost illimitable human imagination that has created tens of thousands of religions, which is the right one? <laughs> Mine. Yours? Mine. How do you know? By, by, by doing my best, as we all do, to try to, c to bring our beliefs into line with reality, uh, to look and see which hypothesis makes the most sense of the world to us. I'll, I'll do what uh, Sean did. G give me like your best argument for why the Christian religion is the right one and all the others are wrong. Just like that, your favorite number one. I know there's well, five or ten. Or <laughs> that would be uh, like me asking you to give your favorite argument for evolution. It's it's too complex to answer that way. But I'll, I'll give a single example that clarifies the point. Y you gave a melange of accounts of creation in your earlier um, account. What you didn't note is that unique of all the religions the Jews and the Christians assert that the universe was created from nothing. In other religions, God or gods fashioned the universe out of some other existing stuff. But the notion that the universe came from nothing and had a beginning is asserted uniquely by Judaism and taken up by Christianity. Now that is something that it would seem has been spectacularly affirmed or confirmed 2,000 years later by modern science, that the universe had a beginning, that space and time had a beginning, and that not only before the beginning, that even the word before is meaningless. So this is a unique assertion of Judaism and Christianity, which, is, which refuted the Greek idea that nothing could come out of nothing. OK, so the, the cosmological argument is your favorite argument. Well, now, it's it's not my favorite argument. It's well, an example it's that one. counters sure. yours. Yeah, that's OK. That's fine. But, but you already said that science is delimiting, it's, it's restricted, we don't know for sure. Uh, most cosmologists, as we've seen, do, don't believe in, they either don't believe in God or they're certainly not Christians then. So apparently that argument doesn't hold water with those who know the most about that particular subject. So if science is not the best way, or the, if science is not the only tool, what other means do you gather information to con come to conclusions? How do you know if something is right or wrong, for example? What, what do you... There are, there is historical evidence, philosophical evidence, empirical evidence. I mean, let me give you an example. If we went to a village uh, of 100 people, and 95% of them said, we happen to know this guy named Bill. And there were five guys, of which three of them said, we've never heard of Bill, and two of them said, there's no Bill. There's no such person. We think the other 95 people made him up. They're hallucinating. Uh, we'd have to ask, as outsiders, what's more likely? Uh, that the 95% of people are hallucinating, or that the other five guys just don't know Bill? Um, <laughs> so these are ways, not scientific ways, but human ways, experiential ways, empirical ways, in which we try to determine facts out of the fog of data out there. OK, so in your worldview in which science is not everything, and we all make assumptions, what are, what's your biggest assumption you make? Well, the biggest assumption I make is that there is some explanation for all of this. In other words, uh, here we have nature, uh, and nature has laws. There's a lot of intelligence embedded into nature. That's what we call laws. It takes very smart people to excavate that intelligence out. So you can just pause it dogmatically. That's what there is. And it doesn't require any further explanation. It is its own explanation. Nature accounts for itself. Do you think but, it's possible? Do you, uh, do you well, think it's I'm possible? Just trying that, to finish. Oh, okay. Well, do you yeah. think it's, I'm just carrying that on. Do you think it's possible that 
my assumption that at the causal arrow stops at where we uh, are just where our knowledge hits and, and we just don't know beyond that that your assumption that there is one more step beyond that called God is an assumption that's not testable or even provable not only do well first of all I accept that but I want to point out how it defeats your side of the debate. You have the burden of proving that your assumptions refute mine. But isn't it okay to just to say, I don't know, nobody knows for now, we're just not going to create a whole belief based on something we don't know? Well, the the, your earlier statement I agree with. We don't know. There, obviously, if we're talking about the original cause of the universe, what comes after death, I, I am ag as agnostic about that as you are on the basis of reason alone. Yes. Your conclusion doesn't follow from your premise. When you don't know something for sure, if I'm dating a girl, uh, after a year I'm trying to decide if I should propose. I put in all the data I know, but if I were to ask myself, well, what is life going to be like with this woman for the next 50 years? I don't know. I can say, I'll be an agnostic. I'll wait for the data to come in. But if I keep waiting, she'll marry someone else or we'll both be dead. Please join me in thanking Michael. Dinesh. And for the final cross-examination, Dinesh, you have the baton. Let's take up the idea that science has refuted religion. So I'm going to state some of the premises of religion, and you give me the scientific refutation. God created the world. No evidence for that. And you consider the, no, the fact that there's no evidence that God created the world to be a refutation. The null hypothesis states that your hypothesis is not true until proven otherwise, and I don't accept the arguments for God's existence. Therefore, the null hypothesis is affirmed. We know of no God. We have to assume that there isn't. All right. <laughs> do, human beings, do human beings have free will? Um, I would say no, based on the evidence so far. All right. So now I, I want to go back to a statement that your partner, Sean Carroll, said earlier, which is he said there's no purpose in the universe, but we can create purpose. How can we create purpose if we don't have free will? Well, the process of creating purpose is itself a deterministic process. Part of the overall causal net of the universe, within that, evolution has created the propensity for us to have goals, to work toward those goals, and that's what gives us the feeling of purpose. The emotion or feeling of purpose gives us meaning, and that's all part of the whole causal determined universe. And is it equally true that all your arguments here today, as well as Sean's, are giving you the feeling of making rational arguments, but these are actually not really <laughs> rational arguments? <laughs> I have no choice but to believe that. <laughs> and I suppose I have no choice but to disagree. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> that's the problem. Now, <laughs> Sean Carroll said earlier that if there was the possibility of God, we would consider and examine that scientifically. We would be open to considering what such evidence might be. Yes. Now, since Christians, and I think this is probably true of most religions, have never held God to be a material being, you would have to be looking for evidence for immaterial things. Here's my question. Do you believe in immaterial things? Well, I don't think that science can, by definition, measure something that's not measurable. So something that's supernatural or outside of the natural world, if it's outside of space and time, we can't get at it. So at some point, your God has to dip into the space-time continuum and stir the particles, and then Sean should be able to measure it and say <laughs> whether it's happening or not. Aren't there, aren't there innumerable immaterial things in this world that we can't measure? You mean like truth or beauty or... How about a thought? Love? Can you see a evidence? thought? A thought, yes. Well, I think thought is a product of what neurons do when I didn't ask fire. you what it's a product of. I asked you if it can be measured. Yes, it's measurable by the fact that we can do a single electrode measurement of a neuron that fires when you report something. Uh, you're, talking about a, uh, you're talking about a physical correlate of a yes, thought. You're not talking right. about thoughts themselves, are you? Yes, well, we do make the assumption that thoughts, the correlation is connected because of the consistency across different modalities of measuring the brain activity results in the process of something we call thought. Let's be careful not to reify thought into something that actually exists. It's just neurons firing and we're calling it something. And that's an assumption, like you said. It's not a conclusion, it's an assumption. Let me give you a further assumption. You said what? that if we, if we damage parts of the brain, yes. 
our thoughts disappear and therefore it shows that the brain is the cause of thoughts. That, that's right. All right. Now if I were to take out my iPod and I were to smash it, no music would come out of it. But would that prove that the sound waves are caused by the physical mechanism? Well, there'd be no more sound waves from that That's device. right. But would that prove that the sound waves don't exist? Isn't yeah, it possible? Yeah, I'm I offering it, a rival I think hypothesis. It would. No, I it think would. it would. Let me offer a rival hypothesis that the iPod, just like the, the, the hardware of a computer, is the physical uh, chassis or substrate required for the sound waves to manifest themselves, but the sound waves are not identical with the iPod. Okay, so but what have you actually proven? If there were no iPods anywhere, there'd be no... Well, okay, there's other Well, what about devices, downloading it on, on other apps? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, okay, but if that's the case, isn't it follow, picking up what Sean Carroll said earlier, that even though human life after death may not be able to exist in this physical app, yes. there is always the possibility of other manifestations or apps in which consciousness might endure. Well, I'm hoping... Is that a possibility? That's a possibility if we could build a computer And do you write that enough. off automatically, or do no, you no, no, no. consider think, it? I think the, the, the futuristic sci-fi scenarios of downloading our thoughts onto computers while, while having a problem with the identity problem, I think, is a possibility, sure. But there has to be the platform, the medium. The there app. has to be a platform, not necessarily this platform. Well, something All that right. works. Ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Nicely done. Can I steal a minute off your closing yes, comments and it. hand it yes. to the audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please come to the microphones. The speakers have now allowed me to steal a minute from their closing statement, no. giving us a, just a few more minutes. Um, uh, I know, you probably wrote yours out, Ian, so that's going to be a problem for you. Um, we're going to go back and forth. I've got two things I'm asking. It's going to be brutal. One sentence statement or question. If you name the speaker, that person will ask. If it's unnamed, uh, any two persons can ask. I want to have as many people be able to get their voices out, and then we have our closing statements, and stay tuned for Sam, Sam Harris after we're done. Hello. Uh, yes, the um, science, of course, is based on empirical evidence and examining that evidence, and scientists that I know of are perfectly comfortable with um, not knowing the answer. Why, for this question is for the, re the believer's side, why are you so uncomfortable with not knowing. Thank you. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> wow. There you go. Next question. <laughs> oh, do we have, here, we'll, we'll use both mics, we'll alternate, yeah. thank you. Uh, for the Christian panelists, um, let me just ask three questions. One. Uh, gotta choose your best. <laughs> they had to choose their best, you gotta choose your best. Well, okay. You got one. Do you, do you believe, do you, have you ever worked on the Sabbath? That's your one question? Well, <laughs> I had three, but I'll just pick well, that one. Pick your best. All right. Well, look, Christians have an, an ambiguous viewpoint of the Sabbath. Christians, of course, worship and celebrate on Sunday, which is the day after the Jewish Sabbath. Um, but if you want a simply yes or no answer, yes, I have. Same. All right. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to read because, so I can articulate this. All right. Got to be brief, though. Uh, I think a huge barrier to the topic is the idea that if science is to refute religion, it will need to handle questions of morality and meaning, um, which are generally attributed to religion. So for this side, can you elaborate on what it is about the findings of science that allows for science to make the move from pure description to a more normative role? And maybe if there's time for the other side, what is it about science that doesn't allow for that? Great question. I think actually we have different viewpoints on this because scientists disagree with each other. I think that there is nothing in science that does allow you to move from description to judgment or prescription. My only statement is that when you invent prescriptions, when you invent morality or judgment, it needs to be in ways that are compatible with the universe as it actually works. And, and I, I disagree. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, I do think there's ways to step up there. I think uh, Sa Sam Harris's argument that if we can move from agreement that physical health is good and better than disease, uh, we can also make arguments that certain uh, social conditions are better for our psychological health. And I think we can, we can construct, like the golden rule is a reasonable way of asking somebody how they would feel about it and that we can take objective measures, the fact that people know what th they like and what they don't like, they have some access to their inner thoughts about happiness, 
And so therefore, I think we can at least ground it on some evidence that way. It's not just purely subjective. Thanks very much. Let's move to the next question, please. Yeah, this is for uh, Dr. DeSouza. Uh, you mentioned earlier you were talking about um, the, the physical, pro or I guess, the processes that occur when you're boiling water. And then you sort of suggested that there's some other level of analysis that occurs such that I'm making tea. And that's, that's some sort of, I guess, outside of science, or that's some sort of different level of analysis. And I guess one of my questions is, I'd like you to clarify that because I was unclear about it. You only get one question. That's no, your question. Yeah, no, I mean, it's all the same. Better question. ask it. Uh, okay, so, but there's statistical observable arguments I can make about how likely you are to be engaging in some behavior or another. I mean, I could take a survey. I could, okay. I could say the probability that you are going to make tea is X. And that seems to me that can be scientific because of your past behavior. So what, what was the claim you were trying to make there? That undercuts the, the analogy. Yeah. The, the claim I was trying to make was that there are two explanations. There's a descriptive and a purposeful explanation. Now, notice that when science investigates purposeful explanations, it smuggles in the purposeful assumption. For example, how do you know that people are going to make tea? You have to ask them. Correct. Right? And then you correlate their own description. I'm trying to make tea with the action of, of putting the, 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 the uh, pot on the stove. So the purposeful part of it cannot be investigated scientifically. In other words, it can't be reproduced, it can't be put into a microscope, it can't be observed. All you can see is the whirring of neurons in my brain, and no movement of neurons can be correlated with my desire to have tea. So in other words, all you can do is take my own self-description of what I'm doing and match it up against my two legs moving in that direction and placing the pot on the stove. So I'm saying that the, the, the descriptive element, the scientific element, is complemented to give a full account by a purposeful element that, is, can only, that only comes out of my own private intentions and is by itself not able to be investigated by science. Thank you, Dinesh. Next question, please. Hi, I was curious for this side of the debate, D'Souza and Hutchinson. Um, would either of you say that it's productive to have a debate in which the goal is to de decide whether is to decide whether well, religion, if it's uh, refutable with science, and religion is defined as something that is unaffected by science and is unmeasurable by science, is that a productive thing to even discuss? Okay. If it's defined as <laughs> purely believe not this that. debate is productive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, do you want to answer? Yeah, no, no, you go it. for it. <laughs> He's too polite. <laughs> Religion makes certain claims that are clearly in the domain of the factually verifiable. So for example, the idea that Jesus Christ was an historical person, that he was, became a, a rebel leader, was very unpopular, was crucified, these are empirical claims. Even the idea that Jesus' body disappeared from the tomb is an historical claim that can be verified by historical types of evidence. The atheist and skeptic Bart Ehrman in a recent book on the historicity of Jesus investigates this claim and he goes, I'm an atheist, but I concede that the historical argument for Jesus is valid. Jesus was an historical person and all the atheist websites that say the contrary are bunk. Right, and science doesn't have a monopoly on all the facts. Thank you, we move to this question. Thank you. I have a question to, to scientists who believe in God. You may. You make a claim that God created universe. You make that assertion. Then what, what is to follow is who created God? Well, I, I okay, well, well, one of the rounds said, you know, to ask that question about God doesn't, it fails to recognize that God is not being offered as a scientific explanation of science. So God is a concept which is different from that. And we assert the, the, that God, when we assert that God created the universe, we're talking about a concept and, a, and an entity and a personality, which is something other than what we would think of when we're talking about science and scientific laws and so forth. Yeah, Let me keep going. Is okay. there an answer to the question, we'll who created God? Uh, I'll answer that okay. question. Is God Finish. created I'll answer it. God? I, 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 I'll answer the question by showing the incoherence of the question. Um, <laughs> I'll show you why. An explanation is not rendered invalid by calling the explanation itself into question. If we went to another planet, a ro remote planet, and we saw more? hieroglyphics, skyscrapers, moving vehicles, and so on, we would conclude that some form of intelligent life, let's call them aliens, inhabited that planet. 
Now, would it be a refutation of this explanation to say, well, where'd the aliens come from? Who created the aliens? We may not know, but the fact of the matter is it's a reasonable inference from what we have seen to infer that kind of an explanation. And that's all we're saying. Thank you. On this you side, please. No, you still do not Okay, I'm sorry, sir. We've, everyone's got the one question, but we'll follow up afterwards during the book signing. Go ahead. Yeah, it's not going to be long. Directed to Dr. Uh, D'Souza. Um, made the statement that the burden of proof uh, rested with the science side to prove that God doesn't exist. But it's a logical impossibility to prove a negative. Uh, it seems to me that the burden of proof is on you to state that there, to prove there is a God, and if not, it's no different than any other fantastical claim. You don't pay any attention to it unless there's evidence of some kind. We are here to debate the resolution, has science refuted religion? Now, either the term religion can refer to a sociological description of all the religious practices in the world, in which case the other side hasn't even come close to refuting all those. The central claim of religion is there, there's a God. If, if it is impossible to refute, then unfortunately our, our opponents have taken on an unfortunate burden, an impossible burden, and they lose. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I know the debate question was badly formulated. Next time it should be different. <laughs> uh, this question's for Sean. Uh, so not about anything you said about God, but what you said about math. So you said that it's not empirical, but it's logical. Um, but there's a good reason to think that math isn't logically true, because logical truths don't entail the existence of anything. Like, it's sentences like, if it's raining, then it's raining, whereas math entails the existence of things. So set theory says, there's infinitely many transfinite cardinal numbers. Um, you can't know that by logic, and it looks like, um, and I think you agree with this, you can't know that empirically also, that you're not gonna find a transfinite number somewhere. So it looks like you either have to believe that we have ways of knowing that are not empirical and not logical, or you have to say, we actually have no good reason to believe math. So. Okay, interesting question. We have no good reason to believe math. Because, uh, because what math is about is starting from assumptions and then deriving conclusions. But the assumptions may or may not entail in the real world. If, if a, a possible universe is a point and nothing else, and then in that universe, it's still true that one plus one equals two, but there aren't two things in that universe. So math is always subjunctive. If these things are true, then these things would follow. All right, there's an interesting physical law that Sam Harris turns into a pumpkin at 4.30, so we're going to take our final three questions. Final three questions, and then we'll have... Now, this is a word of advice for you five bright young people. I'm 90 years old, not a scholar. I'm a retired <laughs> yeah. Navy fighter pilot, veteran of f four wars. And this is what I'd like to tell you. The person that should be up there with you should be a psychiatrist. And what he... <laughs> And what the, what the psychiatrist would tell all five of you is this. The planet's over four billion years old. Ever since the planet was here, every living animal has developed a system to control the society. The four-legged animals have their way of controlling the herd and preserving the herd. There's only two things important in in the way animals are controlled. One is the preservation of the herd, and the other one is for the males to own, control, enjoy the females of that species. All right. <laughs> I'm not happy enough. And so, that's the basis of all religion. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, sir. To the, to the panelists, I say, take that. <laughs> no. No. Final two questions. Yeah, this is for one of the two gentlemen. Um, the assumption is the universe is approximately 15 billion years old. Now, in a measurable sense, uh, time requires uh, bodies to revolve around other bodies. But in an absolute sense, time always exists. There always is a before and an always after. Uh, given that the universe will last another 100 billion years, whatever you, uh, figure you pick, okay? At one point, it had a beginning. Question. Given that time is infinity, uh, negative and positive, the universe would have already ceased to exist had it been 
spontaneous combustion as atheists believe. So uh, as scientists, we, we don't know whether time had a beginning or not. We know there was a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. This is what the data tell us. And we tried to develop models, and we we're trying to compare the models to the data. My personal favorite model is one in which time does last infinitely long. But I would absolutely be willing to be disproven by data if someone comes up with a better theory that matches what we know about the early universe. No, but, we, but we know the okay, universe. OK, thanks. So well. final question, please. Uh, 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 Dr. D'Souza, I just want to say thanks for offering some really compelling uh, you know, arguments here from that side. I, I, it's rare when I hear arguments like that, so that was great. Um, uh, my, my question to you is, uh, have you had any um, strong personal experiences with God that have helped uh, shape or strengthen your spiritual convictions? And if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing that with us. Well, I was... Um in a nutshell, I was raised Catholic in India, uh, but it was a social Christianity. Uh, the arguments that appealed to me about it were mainly sociological. I, saw it was, I thought it was interesting that a lot of low caste Hindus uh, actually flung themselves into the arms of the missionaries because Christianity, with its promise of universal brotherhood, even though the practice fell short of that, uh, was a, an escape from the caste system, uh, uh, which was uh, a prison of sorts. Um, I kind of lost my faith in college, flung myself into conservative politics, and sort of rediscovered my faith in adult life, when I actually realized that many of the things I was taught when I was five years old were true, but they were true in a different way. That was crayon Christianity, so to speak. Uh, and, and the reason I'd lost my faith was that I was unable to defend those simplified beliefs at Dartmouth. But there was a more intelligent or refined way as an adult to reconceive those beliefs, and then not only did they survive the test of, of, of skepticism, but they actually provided not only an explanation, but consolation. Uh, in other words, in life, we're looking not only for truth, we're also looking for love and happiness and hope, and the one thing that atheism offers is complete despair. <laughs> Sean, may I invite you to the pudding? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, though we've run a little bit long, it seems like it was a justified to take extra time for your questions. We now move to four minutes, so I'm watching Devin, four minute closing statements by each person. They've been a, done a brilliant job of the debate. These are their final concluding statements. Sean? Ah, uh, excellent. But we took this, the question is a rhetorical question of a 90 year old, and different laws of nature apply to 90 year olds. <laughs> Sean. Complete despair. I, I'm glad that we've achieved this in this debate, if nothing else. Uh, I had a friend once who was basically a skeptic. He was a very hard-nosed guy. He, he didn't believe in a lot of uh, non-scientific ideas, except UFOs. He loved the idea that there were aliens that were flying around the Earth and that, that we, they were buzzing us and, and keeping track of us. And his evidence for this was he was a pilot himself. And his evidence was that there were pilots, incredibly highly trained observers, who saw things that, that looked like UFOs, and therefore aliens. And I tried to explain to him that you can't judge phenomena like this on a case-by-case -case basis. If you want to claim something about the world, you have to fit it into a bigger picture. It's not, did these pilots see aliens or did they not? That's not the choice you're making. The choice you're making is, are there alien life forms who come to visit Earth in relatively small, compact spaceships, do not let themselves be known, hide from us, but nevertheless sort of have enough technology to not be seen directly, but not enough technology to evade being seen by some pilots? <laughs> or did some pilots make a mistake? This is the choice that you're making. And I think that over the course of this debate, we're seeing that this kind of choice of worldviews is what we are all doing. I don't think that there is really any difference in how that side of the room and this side of the room would argue that we should judge evidence in making choices. It's that I just don't think that that side of the room appreciates, the, to the extent that, that this side of the room does, how much the naturalistic view of the world does explain and what a great system it is for accounting for the world that we experience. I really want to go back to the beginning of uh, what I said in the first opening statement. Uh, let, me, let me remember a little story. I once participated in a debate much like this 
but it was in Ireland. It was at University College Dublin. And I was taking the cab from Shannon Airport to the hotel, and the cab driver wanted to know why I was there. So I said, well, I'm going to disprove the existence of God, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and he says, uh, I have a theory about that. You should always listen to your cab drivers. They have good uh, things to say. So the cab driver, because in Ireland, it used to be 20 years ago, 30 years ago, one of the most staunchly Catholic countries in all of Europe. Today, Ireland is largely secular. And my cab driver says his theory was that it was because the church lost its moral authority. A series of scandals and hypocrisy and repressiveness and pageantry over true devotion had led the Irish people. It's not because Darwin showed how species evolved or because Stephen Hawking calculated the wave function of the universe. That's not what people want from religion. And when the moral authority goes away, it's going to be up to science and naturalistic worldview to develop a, a model, an understanding, a, a set of answers for how we should live our lives in this world. And we haven't done that yet. The good thing about a debate like this is that we're attacking tough questions. The bad thing is it's delaying us from attacking the even more important questions of how to live productive human lives in a world governed by the laws of physics. And uh, I, I need to put it in words that are better than mine. So there's a quote from Anne Druyan, Carl Sagan's wife, that was floating around Facebook. After Carl Sagan died, his, uh, Anne was asked, did he have a deathbed conversion? Did he start believing in an afterlife because he was close to death? And she says, Carl faced his death with unflagging courage and never sought refuge in illusions. The tragedy was that we knew we would never see each other again. I don't expect to be reunited with Carl. But the great thing is that when we were together for nearly 20 years, we lived with a vivid appreci appreciation of how brief and precious life is. The way he treated me and the way I treated him, the way we took care of each other and our family while he lived, that is so much more important than the idea I will see him someday. I don't ever think I will see Carl again, but I saw him. We saw each other. We found each other in the cosmos, and that was wonderful. Thank you. Ian Hutchinson, your closing statement. The proposition before us is that religion as a whole is essentially disproved by science, or at least rendered so completely implausible as to be not worth thoughtful consideration. Our opponents have completely failed to show that. And it's not that I, for example, am putting forward a religion that's invulnerable because of being gutted of any real content in order to win a purely rhetorical question. I'm not at all interested in such a pyrrhic vi victory, no. The Christianity that I believe and advocate agrees in its foundational content with what the apostles and the early church taught. Such a Christianity believes that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins, rose again, and lives forever as the second person of the Trinity. That is not at all incompatible with what we have found out through science about the past course and the normal course of the universe. Christianity is as believable today as it was in the first century and as it was to the early church, to the church fathers, to Augustine, to Thomas Aquinas, to Robert Boyle, to Michael Faraday, to James Clark Maxwell, and to Bill Phillips. The story that science and religion have always been at war is a myth that was developed as part of the 19th century polemic arguments to secularize universities. Today's anti-theists don't seem to notice that. They offer us not new atheism, but mostly warmed over Victorian atheism. The factual errors and misrepresentation be be behind such famous books as A.D. White's History of the Warfare of Science with Theology that were written to promote that 19th century myth have been systematically refuted during the past century. And indeed, a far more positive case has been made, for example, by scholars such as Ian Whitehead and other historians and philosophers of science, that as a matter of historical fact, modern science grew and flourished in the Christian West, not despite, but because of Christianity. That Christianity served as a kind of fertile philosophical and intellectual climate for science's development. 
The false idea that science has refuted religion misunderstands science itself. More often than not, it's founded on the erroneous but often hidden prior assumption that science is all the real knowledge there is. Such scientism is, as we just heard con uh, conceded, a philosophical position, not a finding of science. It is, in effect, a substitute religion. It's an unproven worldview with a justifying narrative, a history, uh, an integrative co cosmology, an interpretive lens or filter through which to view the world, a community of believers who uh, look to it as a source for ethics. These are all characteristics, I submit, of religion. Because scientific methods don't actually apply to a host of vitally important questions about the world, scientism provokes an understandable hostile reaction, not just from religious believers, but from scholars in all kinds of disciplines like history and literature and philosophy, the humanities and the arts. And in so doing, um, the unjustified inflation of science's scope to a pretended monopoly of knowledge represented by scientism and by the proposition, for example, that science has refuted religion, damages the reputation of science itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't resort to just so psychological stories that purport to explain where the skeptics' beliefs come from. By being here today, I do you all the favor of taking your ideas seriously, and I urge that you do the same, and if you do, I believe you'll find that the proposition that science has refuted religion is simply not credible, it doesn't describe the state of the intellectual debate, and it does not describe the state of the world. Thank you very much. Michael Shermer. Science is not a religion. It's not even a belief system. It's just a system to test claims. It's a, it's a, it's a methodology. It's not a thing. Uh, so it doesn't require faith. It doesn't require anything. You just have to roll up your sleeves and do the work. If you want to get a spacecraft to Mars, you use astronomy, not astrology. We, we, it's not because we believe in it. It's because it works. So it's very different from religion in that respect. <laughs> now, I mentioned uh, that uh, we can socially deconstruct religion, uh, and I do think that has value in... Uh, refuting its claims to some kind of special knowledge or access to the truth with a capital T. I think if the universe has a God and there is one right religion in that sea of illimitable possibilities and the other 9,999 ones are wrong and you guys are atheists of those two and some of us just go one God farther, I do think that's a reasonable argument. I mean, again, what are the chances that we happen to have gotten it right and everybody else is wrong is a reasonable one to ask. If there is a God, I would think that certain things should be true. That is, he's supposed to answer prayers. And yet, when you do controlled studies on prayer and healing, for example, funded by the Templeton Foundation and conducted at Harvard Medical uh, School, that um, there was no difference between the prayed-for group and the not-prayed-for group. You would think that something like near-death experiences would represent a connection to the afterlife. And yet, whenever attempts have been made to, say, put a little note up on, an, uh, on a shelf, that nobody can see because it's too high, that when you float up out of your body, you'd read it and come back and then report, you know, it says, you owe me five dollars or whatever. Um, and yet, th that has been done and no one's ever come back to report what was on the slip. They always report the white light at the end of the tunnel and, and, and that sort of thing, but tunnels and lights are a product of the visual cortex and we can rep reproduce that through neural stimulation. Uh, we know that uh, intelligent design has failed as a scientific endeavor to find some sort of a top-down design built into, say, DNA, the eye, bacteria, flagellum, take your pick. Uh, and yet, evolutionary biologists have shown time and again that those are products of a long, convoluted history, not a particularly well-designed, not intelligently designed system, but historically designed system, because that's how natural selection works. The universe is not finely tuned for us. We're finely tuned for it. Most of the universe is incredibly inhospitable to human life. If God was going to create a universe hospitable for us, why can't we just go and hang out in space and do all kinds of cool things like that? And why did it take him 13.699999 billion years to get around to us and our particular culture since the time of civilization? 
Uh, that, that makes no sense in that context. Uh, to say that morality is a product of religion and religions have some value in that sense, okay, so I gave you the long history in one minute. Uh, basically, uh, religion served its purpose. There was no other system around at the time. This is, we're going to make a set of rules. Here's the rules. Everybody has to abide by them. We have to get along somehow. Okay, it was a good start, but we can uh, uh, improve and we can move beyond that. We have moved beyond that. I started my opening arguments by quoting Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement about the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I think we can make, uh, uh, there's good historical data to show that religion has not led that moral arc but has been trailing behind it, that there's other forces at work. Those forces are reason, science, empiricism, and some testable, reliable means to know what works. Science is the best tool we have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now for the final closing statement, Dinesh D'Souza. I love science. I think that it is a, an unrivaled, fantastic, magical, testable way to discover the natural world and to make our lives better in that world. I love reason. That's why I'm here, uh, not only in this debate, but have debated now probably 25 times against leading atheists. We, I did about 10 debates uh, against Hitchens alone. We got to be good friends. One of the interesting things I've noticed in, in, in getting to know some of the leading new atheists uh, is that when you probe and get to know them better, you realize that their atheism is actually a form of wounded theism. Uh, Hitchens, for example, in his autobiography, speaks very movingly about how his mom eloped with an Anglican clergyman. The two of them began a tempestuous affair, which ended horribly when they went into a hotel room and made a mutual pact to kill themselves. If you pick up Richard Dawkins' book and flip to any page, you will read statements like the God of the Old Testament is a genocidal, megalomaniacal, pestilential, filicidal maniac. And you say to yourself, that doesn't sound like a scientist. And in fact, it isn't. It's a very pissed off guy talking about how he feels about a God that he, doesn't, that he claims does not even exist. So what I'm getting at here is that just as you're able to find wishful thinking motives in the believers, I want to suggest that there are equally powerful motives operating on you not to believe. If God is not, Dostoevsky says, everything is permitted. If God is not, you can say we have moral freedom. The Ten Commandments cease to matter. Fornication, adultery, it all becomes okay. Because after all, there is no one to look out over you or hold you accountable for your actions. That's a very powerful temptation to want to get rid of any kind of a cosmic judge. Now, UFOs. The reason, the reason that the testimony about UFOs is incredible, which is to say unbelievable, is that such reports are scattered. They usually come out of Texas and they usually involve, <laughs> and they usually involve small numbers of people sitting outside a trailer who have been drinking. <laughs> now, if it were the case, if it were the case that 95% of all human beings on the planet regularly reported seeing UFOs, regularly reported having an experience of seeing aliens disembark, it would be extremely rash to dismiss that empirical evidence and claim that it can't be so because it refutes the laws of physics. In fact, the laws of physics would have to be accommodated to the reality of human experience that so powerfully and experientially testifies to aliens as facts. So the fact of the matter is when we think about scientific experience, we cannot simply look at external experience. We also have to look at internal experience. There is a whole world inside of us thoughts, feelings, emotions, known only to us. In order to be a pure scientist, you have to pretend that that world does not exist because nobody else can see it, 
They're not aware of my consciousness, therefore there is no consciousness. They're not aware of my free will, so there can't be such a thing as free will. I want to suggest that this is a kind of extreme dogmatism. It forces us to deny what we already know. Namely, that there is an inner world that is as factual, as empirical, as real to us as anything outside. Has science refuted religion? Far from it. All science has done is beautifully describe in another way the world that religion describes, if you will, in moral and in some ways in sublime terms. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our speakers as they shake hands at the end of the discussion. That was great. Yeah, nicely done. Nicely done. Great job, Tom. So Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for doing Thanks. that. Thanks. 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 Th